Let me stop it. Okay, resume, zoom, stop. Did you say yeah. that again? <laughs> yeah. So suppose we have a right invariant Riemannian metric. Where? On a on a Lie group in general. Um, particularly, I have in mind a diffeomorphism group. Yeah, so what does that mean? Um, what are you going to say, probably, right? Yeah, so uh, for like example, like assume we know what it means. Okay. Right. So for example, on a diffeomorphisms of a um, compact manifold. Which I will denote by D of M or the volume morphisms D mu of M, which are uh, eta from M to M, such that eta star mu equals mu, um, and the So here mu is the Riemannian volume form. So we're assuming um, that manifold so that's is the oriented. Uh, yeah, so uh, assuming it's um make sure it's oriented. So I have a, a Riemannian metric on the manifold and um that generates a volume form on the manifold. Uh, and I ask that the diffeomorphisms preserve that. So the topology I put on G um, matters to some extent, but there's a lot you can do without even worrying about the topology. So we'll think of E of M consisting of uh, eta from M to M, such that eta inverse uh, also Eta and eta inverse are, all, are both C infinity. Uh, and I could also say um, work on uh, ds of m, which is eta from m to m, such that eta is a Sobolev hs. And eta inverse is also in hs. Uh, and S is bigger than N over two plus one to ensure eta is at least C1. And there are other topologies I could work with, but those are the most popular ones. Um, and I don't have to work with diffeomorphism groups. I could work even in finite dimensions. Uh, so we could have G a finite dimensional The group um, such as uh, SO3 is the most famous example, which comes up in rigid bodies. But what is the condition about the group that makes this general discussion work? It's a group of diffeomorphisms of a manifold. And, yeah. and what else do you think you need to make this discussion work? Um, you said you could also work on these other groups uh, working on the two sphere in this case, right? SO3? Or uh, yeah, so so basically all I need is um, a Lie group structure uh, and, um, and I can even be somewhat casual about that. So normally for a Lie group, you want um, some topology where the inversions and the compositions are all smooth um, in their arguments. Uh, and you can get away with the fact that sometimes that's not true for infinite dimensional examples. Um, but all you need is uh, to start with a, a Lie group and a right invariant metric on it. So um, I'll start with the action. Uh, minimizing the action is going to give you geodesics. So I want to um, you go through your lecture. Since in infinite dimensions, there are many different definitions of what a Lie group means. And I have mm -hmm. lots of examples in mind of infinite dimensional groups that are generated by Lie groups and stuff. As you go through your lecture, could you just say 
kind of remember a, a little task is to say, what are the actual axioms of the discussion that you, your favorite discussion here that you're actually doing, okay? Like which kind of continuity do you need? Which kind of smoothness do you need of what part of the structure? That's all. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll see where, where that comes up um, once you derive the equations. So when you start, you can work formally just to derive the equations. And then when you want to start talking about solving the equations, um, then you have to worry about the topology you're in and what you're willing to keep and what you're willing to throw away. Um, so I'll be able to discuss that when, uh, when I come to explicit examples. But I'll keep that in mind. Um, and you'll, you'll see where it happens. Um, so for, for, for the moment, we'll work formally. And so we'd like, I guess I'll emphasize this now, uh, we'd like to have a genuinely grouped structure. Uh, which means the operations quotes, are smooth. Which means um, it's a manifold and the operations are smooth, right? Right. Uh, so G is a manifold. And uh, the inversion and composition are C infinity. Uh, so that happens on the full group of diffeomorphisms um, in the fresh shape topology. but not on DS of M because for DS of M, the... Uh, not a ring. <laughs> what? It's not an algebra. I mean, even the functions, yeah. Yeah, yeah if S is large enough, it'll be uh, an algebra of, of functions. But even if S is large, you will still lose the, um, the smoothness of left translations. The inversion and the left translations under composition are not smooth. Um, and you can get away with that to a certain extent, but at some point it'll cause trouble, um, but you can work formally. Just working formally, let's see how far we get. So um, let's start with uh, minimizing the action. So the action is integral from zero to t of um, a to dt, the a to dt evaluated at eta of t, uh, integrated with respect to time. Um, among eta such that eta of zero is the identity and eta of t is some fixed final diffeomorphism. Uh, and so taking the derivative, so the variational derivative, uh, I'm gonna want, oh, I guess before I get to that. So right invariant means um, if we define, so if you in the Lie algebra, I apologize that I cannot make a Gothic uh, lowercase g. Um, I've had many years to learn. I've still never learned it. Um, and so that's about as good as I can do. So that's my, my letter for a Lie algebra. If you was in the Lie algebra uh, defined by uh, eta dt equals u composed with eta, uh, then, of course, the action 
the right invariance of the metric means um, in terms of the action, this is U of T, U of T, ET. Well, you've, you've said Lie algebra here without saying, I mean, without reminding us, this means a vector field on the manifold. Yeah, so the, if, uh, if G is a diffeomorphism group, then uh, U and G will be a vector field on M. And if G is the volume morphism group, then U is also a vector field, but it's also divergence free. And you're kind of using notation. I don't really know what the left-hand side means or the right-hand side of that equation you wrote. So in words, what are you saying? Um, for the action? No, for the equation. The eta dt is u composed of eta or something. Ah, okay. So, um, yeah, so I can, it, it's somewhat easier if I think abstractly and just think of these as elements that I compose. Um, but concretely, this would mean well, I like the abstract. What's the concept? I mean, you can't just write a symbol down. You have to write a concept. Say a concept. Okay. So, um, so the con the composition, the composition is not really defined for these things properly, right? The composition is an action on your composition is what you can do to two diffeomorphisms. Um, so, what's going on here is U is in the Lie algebra, and then um, there's a right translation, uh, is right translation. By eta, or in other words, uh, R eta of some other diffeomorphism C is C composed with eta. Fine. And then that right translation is um, differentiable. So that's the bare minimum we can assume. So if R eta is smooth, Uh, as it is in all the diffeomorphism group examples. Remember, left translations might not be smooth, but right translations are going to be smooth. So if R eta is smooth, then we can differentiate it. So the derivative dr eta maps from G to the tangent space at eta of the group, capital T, uh, and or diffeomorphisms, it's also the composition. The dr eta of u is now an element of uh, the right tangent space, t eta of g. And dr eta of u is u composed with eta as uh, functions. So you compose with eta is not a vector field. It's a translated vector field, um, but it does make sense to say that d a to dt, which is supposed to be in the right tangent space, uh, d a to dt is u composed with eta. So that's my basic equation that relates the right translation by eta. And eta depends on t and u depends on t. So um, if I know what the curve uh, U of T is in the Lie algebra, and that's a lot easier to work with because it's a vector space. If I know what the curve U of T is, I can use this equation to uh, translate that around. Um, and what I'll end up with is, you can think of it as a single vector in the Lie algebra, generating a vector field on the Lie group, uh, and then integrating that vector field and the flow so the flow line that satisfies eta of zero equals the identity will give you the curve in the Lie group that you want. So um, might help that picture. There's my Lie algebra and U. That's U of T and then With my group G, I start at the identity and 
Um, I get my curve eta of t. And at each point, the tangent vector, so right here, eta dot, um, eta dot is what I get from taking the corresponding u of t uh, and applying the right translation derivative to it. Yeah, I love that picture. <laughs> Makes it all I'm not especially proud of it, but uh, no, yeah, no, it, I, no. Did, I did my best to. Um, it shows what you're talking about, you know? Yeah, yeah. So this, this is the, the standard picture, and thank you for asking me to draw it. Um, so I hope this explains what we're doing. So the idea is you're going to look at a geodesic in the Lie group, um, but you can use right invariance of the metric, which I haven't quite, I've, I've sort of written it down. Um, but if you use right invariance of the metric, it's going to reduce the second order differential equation for eta to an equation just in terms of the velocity u of t, which lives in the Lie algebra. Um, and so in principle, a second order equation can only be reduced to two first order equations. One of them is going to be this one, super important. And the other one is some equation for u itself. The somewhat miraculous thing is right invariance of the metric um, is a bunch of uh, conservation laws basically. And that conservation law um, turns into basically some conserve. Well, the right translation is a bunch of symmetries. Those symmetries turn into conservation laws and the conservation law is expressed in terms of the equation for you itself, not depending on eta. So I'm going to show you how to derive that um, in general, and we haven't talked about specific what is eta? metrics yet. Huh? What is eta? You had uh, all eta these large words, and suddenly a Greek symbol appeared. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> eta is the curve. So eta is supposed to be is a geodesic in the group G, um, starting at the identity. Oh, oh. Um, and with some initial velocity. So eta of zero is the identity and eta dot of zero is u zero for some. So you're explaining how the notion of geodesics in any metric space in this context can be converted to an ODE with some nice properties. Hopefully an ODE. Um, so it gets converted equation. I mean, no, but I mean, geodesics make sense without any calculus, right? And you're assuming you're starting with a geodesic relative, well, you mentioned the action, which is that's, that's equivalent to the metric that for which the geodesics is defined. Yes. You're going to say you can give a calculus notation like we're used to, so to speak. Okay. I didn't yeah. So, so in principle, as, as Dennis says, you can you can visualize it pretty easily on a on the lead group. Um, you're trying to pull a string tight between two points, uh, and the problem is actually calculating that. Um, even in really simple cases, like on a sphere, uh, is pretty difficult and involved, um, and that's partly because it's a second order differential equation, um, and uh, and you know, finding solutions of of that can be hard. Um, so even in the standard examples, when you do that, you're still looking for conservation laws everywhere you can. And only when you have conservation laws can you hope to solve it explicitly or even say much about the solutions. Um, Excuse me, you're making a, that's, that's, that's an open-ended thing. You're making a precise statement that you can write some kind of equation with some properties that fits with this problem. So what is the statement that you're making? Right, so the, the statement is the geodesic equation for... Yeah, but that's another name. You see, the geodesic equation is like pretending there's an equation that exists and we know what it means and you're gonna compute it. What's the concept? See, it's a concept. What is it? So, okay. A geodesic is supposed to locally minimize the length um, between any two points. Okay. Uh, I, I throw in locally because um, if I extend a geodesic, uh, if I start with the geodesic, so um, 
I will start with the concept of trying to minimize the length. I'm gonna compute the length by saying, instead of minimizing that, I'll minimize the action, which is equivalent. If you're minimizing the action, then you're also gonna be minimizing the length, but it also throws in a nice parameterization um, where the length, the essentially corresponding to kinetic energy be, being conserved. So it turns that geometric problem of finding uh, length minimizing curves into a physical problem of a particle that's being constrained to have as little acceleration as possible on the surface. Um, and you can prove that those are equivalent. Um, so the minimizing of action is more from the physical point of view where I actually imagine a curve, a, a particle trying to trace this traje trajectory and I don't let it speed up or slow down. I demand that it has constant um, velocity length, constant speed. Okay. So um, then I try and derive an equation for that. And it's essentially Newton's equation, which says the, the second derivative um, of position is zero. But uh, second derivative doesn't really make sense. So I say the second derivative is as close to zero as it can be on uh, this manifold. But an equation for the second derivative is um, difficult to work with. So if I can possibly reduce it to uh, an equation for the first derivative only, then I can um, hope to solve it. And so what's gonna happen is the first that. derivative here is the, the is da to dt. Uh, and even da to dt is a complicated object because da to dt is, uh, when, when I'm talking about vector fields, um, say the Lie algebra of diffeomorphism groups, da to dt is not a vector field. It uh, maps from a point to a tangent vector located at where the particle was. Um, so a part, you imagine a particle starting at some point in the manifold, it follows some trajectory uh, and wherever it ends up at some later time, that's the, the, the location it actually cares about. d to dt is going to be mapping from that initial position of the particle to, the to a vector at the final position of the particle, which is uh, a mess when you're trying to write down an equation for it. So instead, I think of the velocity field uh, u, and that essentially corresponds to, um, let's see. So I haven't, I haven't quite gotten to the point where this makes sense, but I guess to, to set up um, the philosophy of what we're talking about, you should imagine a river. Here, I'll erase this and try to draw a picture of a river. In blue, of course. So on the one hand, I can imagine um, particles. So this particle would be eta of t x1. It starts at point x1, and another particle starts at point x2 and traces some trajectory eta of t and x2. And I can watch these particles move. And if I'm actually sitting by a river, I could maybe throw a balloon in and watch where that goes and say, this is the motion of the river. On the second particle is just off my screen. I don't know if it's, oh, oh here we go. Okay, that, okay, that's good. That, that's good now, so, thank you. Um, so, in, so the difficulty is these, these etas as a function of t are gonna satisfy a somewhat complicated equation. The, um, I can instead tell you at every point, point uh, which direction particles that pass through that point are going. So here, for example, is a picture of the velocity field, u of t and x, and say, when the particle hits the point with corresponding velocity at that position, uh, it's going to say, I'm going to move in this direction. And so if I can tell you just the velocities at each point, and that's what you'd actually see looking at a river. If you didn't have a tracer object um, pointing in, you just stared at a particular spot in the river, you would see everything that goes through that point moves in the same direction. 
uh, or it could wiggle a bit and, um, you know, if the river gets disturbed or the wind blows or something, then those velocities might also change. And so you might be a, a time dependent function, um, but in the typical case for a steady river, you would be a constant function and the particles would still be moving through it, but it would be easy to, to maybe write down some equation for what describes the steady um, velocity field, which determines everything about the river. So if, if you happen to know u of t and x, then you can use this equation, which concretely as a PDE would be the a to dt of t and x is u of t evaluated at uh, whatever position you're looking at. So the particle eta of t and x, eta of t and x is the particle starting at position x. Uh, moving in time. But in the river case, the right hand side wouldn't have a the first argument wouldn't, it wouldn't depend on the first argument, just depend on the position, right? Right, so for a steady river, or in general, a steady solution of the equation we haven't written down yet, um, you may not depend on time at all. Uh, and in that case, then, uh, then clearly you've simplified the situation a lot. Okay. Yeah. So um, question is what equation does U satisfy? In the Lie algebra. Uh, I have a question on the symmetries. At which point do they enter? For example, you mentioned energy conservation. That's a result of the time reversal symmetry of your equation. So it comes come somehow for free. But then that there could be other symmetries that you could impose. Can you? Yeah, that's that. At, that's at what point, the only symmetry. Okay. At, at what point would you impose these extra symmetries if you want your system to have some specific, for example, rotation of symmetry? At which point would you impose that as a constraint? Would that be like through a Lagrangian? Um, um, sorry. Um, um, through you're going to input like extra equations for the constraints? Um, yeah, so. So through like a Lagrange like multipliers, like that's how you would put these extra symmetries in? That's I don't have to do it explicitly. So, so where I put it in when I'm writing down the Lagrangian, um, so the Lagrangian here. Wait a minute, I, 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 I disqualify that question. It assumes you're gonna put in this symmetry. You're making a general discussion from the beginning. We don't know, I mean, it, you're saying there's an automatic time reversal because it's a geodesic, so we can ask this question. I mean, it's like something he's anticipating what you are going to be doing. So, uh, let's see. If it's once, yeah. So once I say it's a geodesic equation, um, I'm going to have the energy conservation. Um, and that's one symmetry that I'll impose or that I don't have to impose. I'll, I'll get for free once I say it's um, a geodesic equation. But when I'm writing down the geodesic equation, I have to tell you first, what's the Riemannian metric? How are we measuring uh, velocities, lengths? Um, and the formula for, for the Riemannian metric is where you can see the symmetry. So here the symmetry for diffeomorphism groups, the symmetry is expressed as a particle relabeling symmetry that um, if, uh, if instead of telling you that eta of t and x is the particle starting at position x and moving in time, 
I said, I don't like the, uh, I, I don't like the positions you put on these particles. You called this first one X1 and you called the second one X2 and I hate those names for it. I would rather instead call this one uh, alpha of X1 and this other one alpha of X2 where alpha is some function I made up to relabel all these things. Um, and that is purely in your head, right? Um, uh, a change of names of the particles, just relabeling the particles. The physics of the situation doesn't care about how you label the particles. So it doesn't care whether you decided to start at eta equals the identity or at eta equals some other diffeomorphism alpha. Um, and because of that, so because that can't affect the energy of the particles, um, that gives you a whole diffeomorphism group's worth of symmetries uh, in your Lagrangian, which is quite a lot. And so that's um, that's the expression of the right invariance of the metric. So the, fa the fact that you have that many symmetries just from writing down the Riemannian metric is, is what's going to reduce the equation from a second order equation to two first order decoupled equations. And Steve, those symmetries correspond to the circulation theorem, right? Um, yeah, the, the, the circulation theorem will fall out in a slightly different way, but it's essentially a consequence of, of the particle relabeling symmetry. I know there's theorem, right? I think it's... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll see that happening. So... Uh, Okay, so remember I'm trying to minimize the action uh, between two diffeomorphisms, which is the eta dt, eta dt evaluated at eta at dt, which is um, u of t, u of t, the inner product. And I haven't told you what the inner product is because I'm still dealing with something fairly general. Um, but uh, um, eventually we'll get to the inner product involves multiplying on the manifold and then um, integrating. But we'll have lots of different examples uh, based on that. So, um, okay, first of all, uh, I want to compute the derivative Compute variational derivative. With respect to a parameter. And that's an A. With respect to a parameter epsilon. With the geodesic eta corresponding to epsilon equals zero. And so what I get is integral from zero to t of u du d epsilon dt equals zero for every which is at epsilon equals zero uh, for every variation u d epsilon. Uh, all right, so to get an equation out of this, um, I'm taking a variation of the velocity field. So it, at first it looks like that's gonna lead to something trivial, um, but the variations have to be, you're actually varying the curve in the group, not the velocity field U. So you have to see how that relates um, to an actual variation. So if we write, if we define W to be d eta d epsilon, um, at epsilon equals zero of eta inverse. So then d eta d epsilon is obviously composing both sides with eta. d eta d epsilon is w composed with eta where w is the new variation field.
So, let's see. Um, okay, so now on the one hand, I've got d eta dt equals u composed with eta, and d eta d epsilon equals w composed with eta. So how are u and w related? Um, well, if I take a mixed partial derivatives, they should be the same. So d d epsilon d eta dt is d u d epsilon plus nabla w u composed with eta. And that corresponds to uh, taking a derivative with respect to epsilon. Um, I both differentiate the part of u that depends explicitly on the parameter and then differentiate spatially because u is being composed with eta and eta also depends on epsilon. So I get this from the chain rule. And here I'm using the Riemannian um, uh, covariant derivative to get two partials. And on the other hand, if I differentiate with respect to eta first and then t, I would get the w dt plus nabla u w goes with eta. And that tells me the u d epsilon at epsilon equals zero is the w dt plus nabla u w minus nabla w u which is dw dt plus the bracket of u and w. And that works on vector fields on manifolds, right? Where the group operation is composition. And more generally, the variations would be given by uh, du d epsilon at epsilon equals zero is dw dt minus add u w. So uh, that's the Lie algebra adjoint, um, which for vector fields on the manifold is negative of the usual Lie bracket of vector fields. So when I plug this in and I say, this must be true for all w, integral zero to t of u du d epsilon at epsilon equals zero, dt is integral from zero to t of u dw dt minus add u w dt and uh, integrate by parts. I get the equation du dt plus add u star u uh, dotted with w, dt equals zero. And that's true for every variation with w, which now tells me I have the equation du dt plus add star u u equals zero, uh, which as I told you before, um, doesn't depend on eta. So the fact that the fact that there was no eta dependence came from this, from when I wrote the action uh, and translated back. So remember, d eta dt is the right translation of u. This is all supposed to be computed at the point eta, the uh, derivative, uh, the tangent vector d eta dt. I can right translate that back and compute it instead at the identity. And if I get the same thing, then that's the expression of right invariance. So that's essentially the fact that when you're computing the kinetic energy of the river, it doesn't matter uh, where you started defining the positions of the particles. And just that fact introduces enough symmetries that you now get this um, equation purely on the Lie algebra. This is the Euler Arnold equation. On the Lie algebra, 
or U of T. And if I'm lucky, I might get solutions like, um, so if U zero satisfies add star U zero, U zero equals zero, then U of T equals U zero is a steady solution. Um, but lots of the solutions are not steady. Everyone's still with me? I have to do this what I'm teaching because I, I don't know if I've lost my internet connection if, if people aren't talking anymore. Yeah, so, so intuitively, where has the pressure term that we're used to seeing in Euler's equation disappeared to? Uh, it's hiding in the add star. So essentially, um, I'm going to compute this in, in each case differently. But uh, so let me start with some examples. Um, so add star u u. So what, what's our situation? Um, for the volume preserving diffeomorphism group, uh, u and w are divergence free fields. And when I compute uh, add star u u dot w, that's by definition the same thing as add u w, which is minus uh, the bracket of u and w. And that's going to be. Um, and so what I mean by this uh, in a product of the uh, vector fields is actually integrating over the manifolds u dot bracket uw uh, with respect to the volume form. So um, that's the same as u dot del u w minus del w u. And because it's volume preserving, um, this is u dot del u w plus uh, one half uh, w dot um, gradient of norm u squared, which goes away because it's divergence free and there's no boundary. So any divergence free vector field dotted with any gradient is zero. And that also tells you that this is um, nabla u u dot w mu. And so you wanna say add star u u is nabla u u. Uh, but you can't because you know that these are supposed to be the same uh, for every divergence free vector field W. Um, but, uh, but gradients will also disappear when dotted with divergence free vector fields. So all you can say is add star UU is nabla UU plus grad P for some function grad P. Uh, and now this grad P is what enters as the Lagrange multiplier for the constraint for the constraint divergence U equals zero. So my Euler equation is du dt plus grad uu equals minus grad p. Uh, and since that's the Lagrange multiplier, I can just compute the divergence of both sides and say that that must be zero. You get an equation for p, um, which on a compact manifold is uniquely solvable up to a constant the constant disappears, so grad P is uniquely defined by this.
What would happen if you use the whole diffeomorphism group instead of volume preserving? Uh, you get a bunch of other terms. So um, on the full diffeomorphism group, when you, when you do the same thing, uh, you get what's called the EP diff equation. Um, wait, no, EP diff is, is, sorry, the H1 metric. Um, you get some other terms. Don't, don't so, you get just Berger's equation without pressure? In one dimension, yes. Uh, in higher, so the pressure term is only showing up because of the constraints, so you're not going to get the pressure term. Um, but for example, this term that I crossed out, you can't cross out anymore. So you're going to get that term showing up. Um, and also, you would get a term showing up from here because there's a term I, um, I got rid of because u is divergence free and it's not divergence free. So if we were to do the same thing, so let me do that as my second example. On the full diffeomorphism group just of S1 with my metric given by UU is the integral over S1 of U squared dx. Then again, add UW is um, minus the bracket minus uwx plus uxw. And when I compute at star uu dotted with w, it is the integral of, um, of u times minus uwx plus uxw dx. And so getting everything just in terms of W, I would get dx of u squared plus u u x all times W dx, which is three u u x times W dx. And now since W can be any vector field on the circle, uh, the only way this is true for every W is if add star uu is three uux, and that tells me the Euler-Arnold equation is du dt plus three u du dx equals zero. Mm -hmm. uh, is this Berger's equation? Sort of. Almost Berger's equation. Uh, the difficulty is you think Berger's equation is, so Berger's equation is what you'd get if you had this without the three. Uh, and some people of course get very upset if you call this Berger's equation because they say Berger's cared about viscosity more than anything. And if you do this, if you write this equation without Berger's, without Berger's viscosity term, you're insulting the memory of Berger's. So uh, you should at least put inviscid, but in my experience, even writing the word inviscid is not enough to satisfy people uh, who feel calling this Berger's equation insults the, Ber the memory of Berger's. Um, but anyway, without the factor of three, this would be Berger's equation. This would be the inviscid Berger's equation. Um, and you can rescale out the factor of three. Say, so just change my time scale to remove that. But you don't get to do that because you also are dealing with, remember, the flow equation. So if you were to change the equation by a factor of three to get rid of it in, uh, in the Euler-Arnold equation, uh, it would also change the flow equation. So you have some difficulty here because it's not easily solvable by the method of characteristics like the standard, um, you know, kid's first PDE example in Bissett Berger's equation is. Um, so uh, David was asking what happens in the general case on the full diffeomorphism group. And what you're seeing here is I essentially had Nabla UU for the, um, you know, so that's U times DU DX. Uh, here I've got three U times DU DX and each one of those terms 
Each one of those u du dx's is coming from a different term. One of them's coming from just this correct derivative. The next one's coming from um, this, this term that I crossed out. And the third one is coming from the extra term in here that I crossed out. And so those do actually cause you some trouble when you're trying to um, get the solution of this equation. So let's see. What if you use a general manifold instead of S1? Uh, yeah, then those all turn into different things. So um, on higher dimensions, Uh, if I remember correctly, you get um, 3u ux becomes nabla u u plus one half the grad of u squared plus um, something like uh, iota u kind of ugly looking thing. Um, Involving uh, Hodge star, well, essentially involving the, the flat and sharp operators on a manifold. I've never seen a, a really nice way of writing it. Um, so the lead derivative, LU? It's basically like the lead derivative. Um, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So every time we choose a new group and choose a new metric, we get a new example. Um, and so there are, there are lots of uh, basic things you can do as, so in general, for the L2 metric on D mu of M, we get the, Euler equation of ideal fluids, which as you saw, I wrote in the form du dt plus nabla uu equals minus the gradient of pressure. And alternatively, you can, um, if you in, so other ways of writing this are, uh, in 2D, we can also write uh, assuming the first homology is um, zero. The divergence of u equals zero implies u equals uh, skew gradient of f. And then we get an equation for f itself for the function f. The boiler is. Uh, Laplacian FT plus um, U of Laplacian F equals zero. And in 3D, we can take the curl of both sides. So if omega is curl of U, then uh, E omega DT plus bracket U omega equals zero, which is um, the form we're most familiar with uh, in terms of what Dennis has been talking about so far. So um, to, so directly understanding these equations is really difficult. Um, we can try and understand in simpler cases like uh, say imposing axis symmetry uh, in the 3D case. So we can say, suppose the velocity field U does not depend on the theta direction explicitly in cylindrical coordinates, um, then everything should just reduce to two functions, um, two real valued functions on the manifold instead of three components of a velocity field. And we can write down those equations and try and solve those um, either numerically or try and prove global existence of solutions, but that seems to be just as hard as the full 3D equations, um, at least in terms of the long time existence problem. Uh, in 2D, things are much easier and uh, you're familiar with, um, in 2D uh, solutions exist for all time. 
so uh, to so already the jump from two dimensions to three dimensions is is difficult and to try and get some better understanding of what this structure gives you we, we can try and understand other equations other model equations that have the same basic structure so other examples Um, a simple one is use a different metric. On uh, the diffeomorphism group. So on volume preserving diffeomorphisms, if my metric is instead of just the L2 in a product, I take U, U times LU um, against the volume form where L is a differential or pseudo differential operator. Of order two R. Uh, then we get um, Well, R doesn't really have to be greater than or equal to zero. Any real R. Uh, then we get variations on these equations, like um, in the 2D case. Why is that a metric? Huh? Why is that a metric? Uh, oh, yeah. So I'll, I should at least impose that L is a uh, positive definite. Yeah, right. Symmetric. Yeah, positive definite and symmetric. Um, I can get away sometimes with uh, L just being non-negative, not necessarily positive, um, but then I'm really working on a, a quotient space. And in some of the examples, that's that's really useful to do. Um, makes formulas work out nicely. So uh, then the equations would look like um, in 2D, plus u of L Laplacian F equals zero. Um, and this, so this is most interesting when L is, when L equals um, the Laplacian to the power of minus one half. This is the surface Quasi geostrophic equation. Geostrophic. So, what does that mean geometrically? Uh, what, taking that power, the operator no, no, L? No, 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 the words geo, quasi geostrophic. I mean, what physical thing are you talking about? Uh, so, I don't know, Theo might, might be able to answer this a little bit better. My understanding of why it's called that is because it's sort of similar to the quasi-geostrophic equation. And the quasi-geostrophic equation is essentially the equation for the atmosphere um, of the Earth when you incorporate um, the rotation uh, and uh. you assume that there's some balance between um, I think the the pressure and or the gravitational potential energy and the rotation speed, and in the in the compromise between those two, you get what's called the quasi geostrophic approximation um, to the full equations. Uh, throwing in the surface quasi geostrophic um, is. I guess it was inspired by this at some point, but but it's not really related to to that equation, and I'm not sure if there's any good physical um, meaning of this equation. But Steve, actually, I, I think that it, the dynamic. So if you look at the the quasi geographic equation, the one you just said in 3D, and you have a fixed surface up top. The surface quasi geostrophic equation are the dynamics on that surface, and they close there in a oh, certain okay. regime. So, so it's it's real. It's the same equation, just 
in a certain regime where the dynamics close at the surface. And that's like a 2D, now it's a 2D picture. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense because physically the only way you get operators like Laplacian to the one half or to the minus one half is if it's a um, boundary case of something simpler in, in higher dimensions. Um, so yeah, this is, I guess, representing the boundary of a full 3D model. Um, is, that, is that because of this fact that when you restrict to a hypersurface, you lose half a derivative? That's pretty much exactly the reason, yeah. Uh, you, you, you lose half an, an L2 derivative. If you're working in LP, it would be one over P. Yeah, oh, so here, here everything's basically you know, physically kinetic energy wants to be L2 in something. And so, so you get operators like this. Um, I'm losing half a derivative. Okay, so the SQG equation, um, I think it's primarily uh, of interest as a mathematical model because it's supposed to be similar to the 3D Euler equations, except it's an equation for a function on the manifold instead of a, a vector field. Obviously, anytime you can reduce the dimensions of the, the objects you're looking at, uh, you hope to get things simpler. And so I can take any power of the Laplacian here instead of minus one half. Uh, so minus one half is SQG. Um, power zero is the standard Euler equations. Uh, as that power gets higher, the properties of this equation get nicer and nicer. Um, so essentially, this one where you get SQG is the critical case um, where things are just barely nice enough. And I'll explain what that means in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, the 3D version of this is, um, of course, that L curl U T plus, well, actually it's still the same thing. Write it this way, omega T plus bracket U omega equals zero where now omega is um, L applied to curl of U. What? Um, oh no, that's not right, is it? Yeah. Why is that L there? Oh, that's because if I, if I insert the L into the, uh, is that right? Well, I mean, that's the Euler equation on the left. Yeah, but if, if L is the identity, then it's the standard 3D Euler equation. Yeah, but it's not in the, L, in the L2 metric. And on L, oh, I see you, oh. oh you so now if I imagine generalizing, I can say, take any differential operator or pseudo differential okay. operator, okay. change the order of that equation. Okay, okay, sorry, I misunderstood, thank you. Yeah, um, so that's based on that's the correct equation for this metric, which may reduce to the 3D Euler. Um, so again, the, the stronger um, of a differential operator L is, uh, the nicer properties this will have. So if you start looking at it that way, then you see that 3D Euler is just critical for, um, for example, having a nice ODE interpretation um, or Fred Holmness. And if you tune the parameter of um, how many derivatives Please. appear in L, uh, you get slightly nicer properties. Uh -huh. and I'll, I'll, you're again, saying I'll... that equation with L uh, having some actual positive derivative effect will actually be solvable in 3D? Um, yeah, it's uh, so certainly Any if, I'll, if the derivative is, if, if the number of derivatives is large enough, then, then you'll essentially get it for free. So one of the things that's happening, uh, the plus and uh, the minus 0 0.01 power, <laughs> is that enough? Oh, that's making it worse. I know, but I mean, so Euler, as you said, was critical. So I wanted to know. Yeah, if, no, I want a positive if, power if in that Laplacian. If you had a fairly small amount, you would win. Um, things get easier. So unfortunately, it's still not even known. So even with say L equals, actually, I think I, I wanted, um, I wanted L squared here. Uh, I might be confusing the situation too much. 
No, I just want L, sorry. But if L is um, the Laplacian, for example, uh, which for divergence free fields would be curl squared, um, global existence or global behavior is not known. Um, but for example, you can say it's easier to prove. So it's considered, people have done like partial results of what you would need in order to get global existence um, for a stronger metric like this. And it's, and, and, and essentially the gap between what we have for free from the energy and what we need for the global estimates to work, that gap is smaller, but it's still not known. Uh, but for example, if I took uh, Laplacian squared, then I would get global existence. Oh yeah? Steve, yeah. Steve I think you would need Laplacian cubed. Am I not quite high enough? I, I, was, I was guessing on that. I, I didn't work it out. Three of the metric. Uh, yeah, so you need n over, n over two plus. Yeah. So you, okay, I believe you. you. More than two. Three would be um, For L equals Laplacian cubed, uh, global existence would be free. Uh, and so that essentially happens because, and what you should keep in mind is um, the right invariance of the metric is supposed to tell me that if I have some ball where the solution uh, exists, right? Some ball of initial conditions and I can say, for those initial conditions sufficiently small, I can find a geodesic that goes out for a short amount of time. Or if I make my velocity small, then for time one, I can go out. Or if I, um, yeah, so something like that. So I should be able to take this ball of um, initial values where I get a solution and translate it around the manifold and say, if I was able to get this far, uh, then just translate back to the identity and still get uh, that exact same distance and keep going to extend the solution for all time, which works very well on a finite dimensional manifold in the finite dimensional Lie group, right? That, Symmetry um, gets you things working for free. Here, the reason that doesn't work is um, that essentially corresponds to, um, well, the, the failure of the group operations to be smooth uh, is what results in that approach not working. So the topology you need to work in, and I guess, it, In the topology that you need this, for this to be a manifold, um, it's not the same topology that's generated by the Riemannian metric. So lengths are preserved in the L2 topology, but the Sobolev topology or the C1 topology is what you need for this to be a manifold and those norms are not preserved. By what? By the equation itself. Right, so there's no conservation of energy that for free gives you the H2 or the H3 norm is preserved. Um, and that's essentially the reason that, that you get this global existence for free if you have a high enough power, because then you get um, the H3 Sobolev space. The H3 norm is preserved by the equation and also H3 is strong enough to give you a good topology on the manifold, an actual manifold topology. Um, and that's why the conservation law for free gives you global existence. So in general, that, that gives you a way of thinking the, the, um, the more derivatives I have in the metric, the stronger a topology it's generating on my group and the easier time I'm gonna have turning the basic energy conservation law into um, a PDE type estimate that gets me uh, long time existence. So one more example um, in the easiest case where we can understand things in 1D, uh, 
the equation looks like. So here, I'm on the group of circle diffeomorphisms and my metric on velocity fields is the integral over the circle of u times lu uh, dx. And the euler arnold equation is uh, lut plus uh, ulux plus um, two ux lu equals zero. And you see in the case when l is the identity, this gives you the uh, inviscid Burgers equation ut plus three uux equals zero. But now L can be any um, positive definite or at least non-negative uh, symmetric differential operator. Um, as examples, when L is the identity minus dx squared, you get the kamasa holm equation. And the easiest way to write this is to say mt plus u mx plus two u x m equals zero, where m is u minus u x x. Or another example, when L is h dx, where h is the Hilbert transform, So we get obviously the same equation uh, with just with a different definition of M. That's not positive anymore. It's not positive. It's uh, so what you actually have is you can either think of it as a degenerate Riemannian metric. Well, it's got um, times. No, huh? the Hilbert transform. I don't know what your symbol means. You said Hilbert transform, right? Yes. Applied to D by DX or what? Yeah. It's oh. not negative. Okay. Uh, it kills constants, but aside from constants, it's it's non-negative. So the easiest way to understand this is um, to apply it to a uh, Fourier mode, and it's the absolute value of n times e to the i n x. Oh, I see. Um, and so that's why it's positive definite. Or yeah. Positive definite except for constants. And so to do this properly, you're actually doing it on the diffeomorphism group of the circle, modding out the rotations. Um, or you can just be somewhat casual and say, uh, it's like a GDS equation, except um, some vectors have length zero. The proper way to do it is on a, on a quotient. Um, so you can generalize a, a little bit. So if, um, notice the factor two uh, is always gonna come from geodesic equations. You can also, even more generally, LUT plus ULUX plus lambda UXLU equals zero or any constant lambda. Uh, and the reason for doing this is it allows you to get somewhat different structure and things that are closer to the genuine Euler equations of fluids. So for example, when lambda equals minus one, uh, and again, LU is HUX, it's the de, de Gregorio equation. These are still examples of the Arnold equation, right? It's no longer an example of the Arnold equation when lambda is not two. Oh. So what changes now is so if lambda is not equal to two, energy um, u dot LU, dx is no longer conserved.
but you can still think of it as a geodesic equation for, okay, so it certainly does not represent a Riemannian geodesic equation, but if you're willing to talk about connections that are not Riemannian, then you can still say it's a geodesic equation of some connection. Okay. So it's a geodesic equation for a non-Riemannian connection. And, and the reason why lambda equals minus one is interesting is you have uh, omega t plus u omega x minus u x omega equals zero, where omega is h u x. And it looks a lot like the 3D Euler equation. Which is of course, omega t plus um, nabla u omega minus nabla omega u. Equals zero with omega equals curl of u. So h u x is the closest thing we have to curl in one dimension. Um, and people believe that, uh, many people believe that if you can figure out global existence or breakdown for the uh, De Gregorio equation, it would give you a, a pretty big clue towards uh, the same question for 3D Euler. But that's still unknown. Um, so I can tell you for, for, if you're willing to change the parameter, for some values of the parameter you have, um, you may have global existence. For some values of the parameter you may have breakdown and for some values you may not know one way or the other. In this case, we don't know um, the De Gregorio equation, the global existence, even for De Gregorio is unknown. And here I, I should be somewhat careful um, for C infinity uh, initial velocities, U zero. Uh, if you're willing to work in weaker spaces, um, you can get solutions that break down, I believe for the De Gregorio equation, um, but it's unknown whether smooth solutions will break down in finite time. But if I change the parameter, for example, for every positive value of lambda, uh, it's known that all solutions will break down in finite time. Um, and I believe it's, it's conjectured that for sufficiently small negative values, you get global existence, but for sufficiently large negative values, you get breakdown. And I think there's a recent result um, where at least part of that is known. If lambda is sufficiently large and negative, then you get breakdown. Um, here, my notation is a little bit different from the standard notation because I'm trying to make it fall out of euler arnold equations. Okay, so um, now Dennis asked at the beginning, what's the topology you're working in? And uh, I'm just gonna mention that because when we're talking about the local and global existence questions, um, that becomes really important. So in, Um, okay, what does this approach give you? So it gives you some things, um, if not for free, then at least in a kind of easier way. Uh, I did say in, in some cases you do get things just for free. So for example, if you have um, a sufficiently high order of your differential operator defining the metric, you will get global existence for free. Um, you can get local existence fairly easily um, under some conditions. So I'll discuss a little bit of that to finish off here. The local existence um, in the geometric approach. Uh, so the, the somewhat of a paradox here is um, we go from the second order geodesic equation to the first order Euler-Arnold equation on the Lie algebra in order to make things simpler, um, but it makes theorems harder to prove. 
So actually to get a good local existence theorem, it's easier if you work in the sec, if you work with the second order equation for eta um, for the following reason. So example, let me just do this as an example. Um, my, the Kamasa home equation can be written as Uh, we already wrote it one way, but another way of writing it is ut plus uux equals minus px, where uh, p satisfies p minus pxx equals u squared plus one half ux squared. Okay, so as uh, we'd like to call this an ODE, but it's not, this is not an ODE. on any reasonable infinite dimensional space. And so by reasonable, I mean something like um, a Banach manifold where you have, uh, you can prove existence of ODEs by Picard iteration. Right? So that's a, that would be a reasonable space uh, to call something an ODE, right? Because if you, if you want to say it's an ODE rather than a PDE, uh, it should be easy to work with like an ODE is. And the reason it's not an ODE is because when I'm solving for u, du dt involves the derivative of u. So it, whatever space u lives in, uh, du dx lives in a less strong space. So for example, if I'm trying to do this for u in C1, well, the, the right side of this equation is at best in C0. So I'm trying to, uh, uh, I can't treat it as a, uh, du dt is some nice function of u. What about real analytic? In the real analytic case, so yeah, in, in the C infinity case or real analytic case, it's okay, except in, in the spaces of such functions, you don't have the, um, uh, you don't have the contraction mapping principle. Yeah. So that you can, you, so there is, uh, I mean, there are different schools of, of how you resolve this problem of you know, infinite dimensions are difficult to work in. One is to try and find a nice um, space to work in where you have lots of tools like a Bonnach or Hilbert space. The other is to work in the fresh A space that you actually care about where your objects are all C infinity um, but then you, you lose the theorems that you get for free in a Banach space. And if you want to do anything with them, you have to prove them case by case. Well, Nash did something, didn't he? Uh, yeah, so, so, so you have to use that sort of technique, um, which can also work. But uh, Nash's technique is definitely harder than, uh, than just viewing as an, as an ODE in a single space. But you, you, you can work around that in order to, to work in fresh air spaces. Um, so the easier method is uh, if I write eta t equals u composed with eta, that implies taking two derivatives, eta t t is u t plus u u x composed with eta. And so the Euler equation for u becomes the equation for eta um, just at the price of composition with eta. And um, so the point is I lose that derivative, right? The derivative u sub x. Um, it's now just two derivatives of eta, but I don't see any explicit spatial derivatives. Uh, I do see one in the pressure term, but notice the pressure term if you think of u being a certain degree of smoothness like C1, then ux will be C0 uh, and p will gain two derivatives. So p will be in C2 and then px is back in C1. So this is a second order ODE um, in space of C1 functions uh, and C1 diffeomorphisms.
And in fact, it's smooth. And even analytic. It's kind of a weird uh, thing. If you're only working with C1 functions, you're not even sure you can take two derivatives. It's kind of weird to think of it as being smooth, but it's smooth in the space of functions. So it's like, if you have a C1 function, you can square it, uh, and that'll be another C1 function. It won't have a second derivative, um, but the squaring operation itself is smooth. You take a derivative of squaring, it's just two times, um, two times the function. So that's essentially the same sort of thing that's going on here. Um, and it's not obvious that this works, but the hint that it works is that at least the number of derivatives is correct. Um, but actually proving this is somewhat involved. You can do the same thing. with uh, the full Euler equations. And so this is the famous uh, paper of Evan Marston in 1970, showing that the, the same thing works. And so you get, uh, since this is a smooth ODE, So this is the 50th birthday celebration of that theorem, the seminar. This okay. is, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> Happy 50th birthday, Evan Marston. Uh, so the fact that it's a smooth ODE tells you that the map from initial conditions to the time one, for example, uh, is a C infinity map. Um, if you try to use that to get solutions of the actual Euler equation, then remember u comes from taking the time derivative of eta and composing with eta inverse. Can you raise it? Huh? Raise the screen a little bit. Oh, right. Yeah, thank you. Um, and that, so although you're, you're dealing with smooth maps, as soon as you have a, an inverse composition here, so there are two things that are going wrong here now. I am trying to, in, to apply the inversion operator to eta. And as I said before, that's not smooth on the um, group of at least Sobolev diffeomorphisms. Right? So uh, if we're on, if G is ds of m, for any finite S, the inversion and uh, left translations are not smooth. They're only continuous. And so that's why if you're if you wanna say this is a smooth ODE and apply Picard iteration to solve it, you have to be in, a, in one of these spaces like DS of M in a, in a Sobolev space or Hilbert space. Uh, but once you do that, you make the sacrifice of, now I've lost the actual Lie group operations. And so the map from U zero to U, say U of one, um, is only continuous. That's smooth. Uh, and in fact, the, so there have been some some uh, some work lately, um, for example, from uh, my colleague Gerard Misiolik, um, who showed that not only is this not smooth, it's not even um, it's not Lipschitz. It's not uh, uniformly continuous. Um, it's, it's hardly better at all than just standard continuity. Um, so in particular, it's not even uniformly continuous. Um, okay, and then there are other things with, uh, so, Essentially, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, 
the more smoothness you have defining the Riemannian metric, the easier things like this are going to be. So for example, this, this type of smoothness of the ODE works um, for the L2 metric on volume preserving diffeomorphisms. For 3D volume preserving diffeomorphisms, uh, it works at the level of L2 and that's critical. So if, as Dennis had mentioned, if you took a Laplacian to the power negative 0.001, um, this would no longer be a smooth ODE. Um, and if you go just a little bit higher, then it's even easier to prove that it's a, it's a smooth ODE, but that um, zero derivatives is critical in the 3D case. In the 2D case, uh, it's SQG, which is the critical equation. So it's that minus one half derivative which is where it's critical. And 2D Euler is safely within that regime where it all works out. Um, oh, this also explains why 2D Euler works out. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's one way of thinking about why 2D Euler is simpler than 3D Euler, because if you imagine tuning that smoothness parameter, uh, 2D Euler is safely... Safe range. Safe range makes that easy. Um, and, uh, and there's various other things you can do like this, but I'll stop here because I've gone on a little bit too long. Yes. So wait, what is the last fractal dimension where 3D order is okay? Think of D as a fraction. I mean, think of three as a fraction. In other words, just, is, is it three halves or something like that? Um, I don't think it works that way. Um, so if I, if, if I make it easier, if I think of, of, of integer orders, right? So in, in it, if I think of standard dimensions, like the higher dimensional Euler equation, under what circumstances does that work? Um, I believe L2 is still critical for that. So it's zero derivatives, which is critical. The only weird case is in 2D where you get something for free that you weren't expecting. Yeah. So, if, if you ask me for a critical transition in terms of the dimension of the, the space, um, I don't really think there is one. I think it's an abrupt transition from two to three, and then every higher dimensional case is like the three dimensional case. That's, that's my understanding at least. All right. Steve? Yes. For, for the full diffeomorphism group, there is no change for the critical exponent for local well-postness at least. Yeah. So what is the magical thing that is happening in? Um, I guess I don't have a good explanation for the magic that happens in 2D uh, volume preserving in that situation. Um, essentially, there's, there's one term that shows up in all the other formulas, but happens to be zero in that case. Um, and it's the term that's causing trouble. Uh, and so the fact that it, it accidentally vanishes is the reason you get something for free in that case. Um, but I mean, that's how I think in terms of things like just, you know, something magical happens in a formula. But that's usually not a very good explanation for other people. Just one more thing, sorry. And for symplectomorphisms, does this happen in any dimension? Yeah, if you were to, if you were to apply the same technique, uh, the same, if you go through the same uh, procedure for a symplectomorphism group, um, it essentially acts like the 2D uh, situation in any dimension. So I believe there, uh, also, minus one half is um, the critical exponent, and by the time you get to L two, you're getting things for free. I mean, a, a, a lot of the things, and so, so I know David had a paper on this in um, uh, not too long ago uh, for the uh, oh, geodesics yeah. and the symplectomorphism group, um, and was able to prove, for example, that uh, in, in any dimension you get the global existence by basically the same technique uh, as you get in 2D. Dave, is that, is that correct summary? Yes. 
uh, the point is that the in in the symplectic case you have the, the symplectic form is preserved and the if you take little d of the velocity field or the, with which is the vorticity you can divide by that symplectic form and get a a function and that function will uh will be pre, will be uh preserved in lagrangian sense and that from there you can get the uh global existence uh, more or less in the same way as you do for uh, the two-dimensional case uh, that was a paper in uh, uh, Gaffa, I think it's called, right? Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Oh, what am I supposed to say? I thought I was done. <laughs> oh, no, I said, Stephen, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought we were finished with the talk, so it's just discussion. It, it oh, actually, no, keep, officially, keep I think time is up. <laughs> no, no, you're, I, um, if, if you didn't get to the second part of your abstract where you mentioned uh, going through where the blow up happens. Oh, OK. Um, uh, yeah. I. I I went a little slow compared to the uh, what I anticipated for the abstract. Um, okay, so so yeah, I'll I'll, I'll just briefly say the uh, the um, the thing I had in mind uh, for some of these model equations. Um, so to see blow up mechanisms. Look at things. And I find the, the most instructive one is, um, is Hunter Saxton, because you can really, there's only one situation where you can solve everything explicitly um, and see the formulas. And once you see that, you can get a sense of, of how things might work in general. So the Hunter Saxton equation is. Um, the diffeomorphism group of the circle with L equals minus dx squared. Again, that's degenerate on the constants. Um, so you're really working on uh, the homogeneous space diffeomorphisms mod rotations. Um, but you don't really need to worry about that too much. The equation itself looks like uh, utxx plus 2ux plus u u x x x plus two u x u x x zero. Can I can I ask something? Uh, did these people work on this because uh, it was some equation they could prove interesting theorems about, or did they have an a priori motivation to want to know this equation? Uh, Hunter and Sexton. Yeah. Um, depends who you talk to. So uh, Hunter. Yes, Saxton. Um, Saxton thinks it's just a toy model, uh, but Hunter Hunter viewed it as more of a um, a realistic model of liquid crystals. Okay. Um, but essentially, you have to throw away a bunch of terms in order for this to be the equation that ends up. Um, and so Saxton, like, they were certainly able to prove lots of interesting things about it. Um, even and but they didn't do anything with the geometric interpretation that came later. Um, they were able to, to prove some things about it, um, but there's some debate about how much of the realistic terms did they throw away and was it too much? I've heard the word liquid crystal, but is, well, what's an example of a, a liquid crystal that I might see or in the kitchen or anywhere, a volcano or anywhere? In a TV. A TV, ah. Uh, I'm not sure if TVs are still being made out of liquid crystal, but they used to TV or computer monitors as well. Okay. Um, so this equation describes, so a liquid crystal is supposed to be, it works out nicely because um, things align 
uh, across the material. And I think that's why it works as a, as a display. Um, but uh, then if you look at the small perturbations of, um, of that steady state, then they satisfy an equation like this. Okay. So it's like some kind of motion in a material that has a, some kind of gridding or thread in it that, 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 that biases the motion or, right. okay. So the solution of this, Um, is sine of kt plus u0 of x over 2k sine k of t, sine of kt squared, where k squared is a quarter uh, integral of the initial condition squared. Um, and so if you actually want to find the flow eta, you can integrate that um, in space. Uh, and you notice that, um, that this can go to zero in finite time. In fact, no matter what u0 is, actually this is u0 prime, no matter what u0 is, this will eventually go to zero. It always reaches zero in finite time. What about the first term? Uh, the first term? Yeah. Cosine, cosine kt? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the sum that'll reach zero. So you're, oh, the sum you're goes adding them together and, and then squaring. So that's, that's, do you take any cosine and any sine of the same frequency and you add them together in some combination, right? And um, it'll eventually go to zero. So the t is like one over k times the arctangent of something. Okay. And that's where it goes to zero. Um, and okay. So reaches, the interesting reaches thing, zero in finite time. It reaches zero in finite time. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, at some value of x. And of course, it is supposed to be a diffeomorphism. So if its spatial derivative is reaching zero, it's no longer a diffeomorphism. It might still be a homeomorphism, um, depending on ex whether the initial condition is constant on any region. Um, so eta, when this happens, Eta stops being a diffio. It may still be a homeomorphism. So I, I have a conceptual question about, we've left the Arnold discussion and we already had, but we're kind of still pretending there's a group here and it's some kind of invariant process that we can move back to the Lie algebra? Yeah. Okay. So we're still on a group. So this, this is the GDS equation for uh, a group. It's, it's degenerate. So it's really the GDS equation on the, ho on the homogeneous space. Um, but for the most part, you don't really need to worry about uh, the, essentially the constant rotations because um, they're invisible as far as the group. No, is but concerned. still, I'm 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 uneasy about the lambdas that were not Arnold types and I mean, far away from them. Oh, but remember, this oh, is oh, I'm wondering good if, you a, if you have a more general concept of a of class of problems that you can write with formulas and ODEs and so on. But there's a group involved, and there's some kind of it's a group theoretic set of problems which are more general than the geodesic problems. Or are they? Is it, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. So, so in terms of in terms of what is, what do other values of lambda mean? Um, I'm not sure we have a really great, uh, you know, understanding of those. In partly because even in terms of 
differential geometry, we have a much better understanding of Riemannian geometry than other types of geometry. So we're oh, dealing with- There you said it was the geodesic for a connection. Yeah. Okay. But still then, but I mean, is that, what is the abstract, no, I'm asking for what is the abstract notion in terms of a group of the set of equations we're considering, all of them in so, the book. Yeah, so we're still considering, we're, we're considering geodesics on the group um, and the connection is right invariant. Oh, okay. So now, the, so if the metric is right invariant, then the connection pretty much for free will also be right invariant. Even if there's no metric that's defining the connection, you could still say, uh, I request that the connection be right invariant. Sure. And if that happens, then you get an equation uh, just of first order on the Lie algebra. Okay, okay. So all your geodesics are still- That includes all your examples. And that includes all the examples. Yeah, so the even, yeah, it could be something even in Lorentz geometry now, if there's a connection around that's compatible with any group of symmetries. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, and, and, and there are some examples where, um, where there's a Lorentz metric which generates the natural equation. So, um, so in fact, even in uh, even in three D Euler, um, if you consider the remember, the, I had the L operator which tells you how many derivatives to take in the metric. If L is the curl inverse, um, then you get a you get a bi-invariant metric on the group of 3D volume morphisms. Um, and that's oh, really? not a Riemannian metric because curl is not positive definite or even non-negative. Um, so but like it's infinity, still- Minus infinity. I mean, yeah, PQ, so it's, PQ are both infinity. <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, okay. No, that's a great idea. I mean, I love that. Form. Yeah, Smolens have worked that out in a paper a long time ago, and I always thought it was a really cool idea, but I never, I'm not sure anyone ever figured out what to do with it. Yeah. Um, but, but well, yes, yeah, so, so well, sometimes that's a natural thing to consider. Well, what is the name? Mullins? Uh, Smolens, so, so Smolens said. Smolen? Oh. Oh, Smolens, Smolens, oh, Smolens said, okay. Thank you. So this was, um, I believe the paper's called, obviously a, a translation of um, a Russian paper, but it's called Bi-Invariant Metrics on Remorphism Groups, something like that. Right, I mean, that form is non decaying uh, volume preserving, yeah. Um, but his specific example was uh, curl inverse in 3D. Yeah. Steve, one question again. Sorry, is this yeah. the generalization of the bi-invariant buffer metric to 3D, basically? Uh, yeah, it depends how, how flexible you are with the word generalization, right? Because the Hofer metric is uh, at least non-negative, um, whereas this metric is is more like a, a Minkowski type. So. Um, you know, does that even count? I mean, with, with Hofer metrics, the, with those types of metrics, the, the big question was, you know, are they non-degenerate or not? Um, here, that doesn't really even make sense because obviously uh, if you've got signatures, then um, lots of things have zero. Just to, as a quadratic form to be non-degenerate, right? It is non-degenerate on the volume preserving. It's... It's not positive. Probably non-degenerate. Depend. I think that depends on the homology. But in most cases, it would be non-degenerate. But yeah. uh, I mean, you can adjust the homology to make it. Yes. Right. So, so one of the interesting things about Hunter Saxton is um, the the Riemannian metric here. Riemannian metric, uh, which here is integral ux squared dx, is isometric to the sphere. So round, I mean the standard metric. Um, so it's got curvature 
constant curvature. Um, and the isometry there is uh, eta maps to the square root of eta x. And essentially the reason it works is, so if I call this some function f, um, if I'm on the circle of length one, then eta of one minus eta of zero is one. And that corresponds to integral from zero to one of f squared dx equals one. And that's where the, the round sphere is coming from. It's basically just Euclidean metric uh, for f, the standard L2 metric uh, with that constraint. And the diffeomorphism group is, if I, if I pretend infinite dimensions are three dimensions, the diffeomorphism group is this region where the function is positive um, at every value of x. And what geodesics do is they try and get out of that and then try and come back. Um, so on the, so the, the blow up mechanism corresponds to a real thing on the, on the Hilbert sphere, which is um, some component of this function, which is supposed to be everywhere positive, going negative. Uh, and in fact, if you, if you consider the, the map backwards from the, the space of such functions, if you square it and then integrate to get eta, right? So eta is now the integral of f squared, zero to x, uh, that will correspond to these geodesics being squared and living inside the triangle. Um, and so again, you can kind of see the blow up mechanism being um, a diffeomorphism tries to escape, become a homeomorphism, and essentially it slides along the boundary, right? So this formula is actually well-defined for any value of t, even after the breakdown, even after eta x has gone to zero. Uh, and for a while, eta x remains zero. At some, there's some value of x for which eta x is zero. And then eventually, as t gets all the way back around to two pi over k, this goes back to the identity. So it's kind of slid along the wall of the diffeomorphism group and then come back in. Um, so that's, it first of all, gives you a nice picture of what weak solutions look like. Uh, and uh, at least that's one of the blow up mechanisms. Wait, wait, but you, you're talking, you have this picture here and then you were talking about the diffeomorphism group. That's not this picture. This is not. The red part is the diffeomorphism group. Oh, the red part is the diffeomorphism group. Right, so F. Oh, the walls, but you had it going through the wall. Right, so if, so here it's going through the walls. The, the weak solution of this is an equation for F, right? And the square root of eta x is F, which is the square root of this. Um, well, wait, I don't want the formula. Just tell me what the, you said something it goes along what the diffeomorphism, which is red, goes to the boundary and then it slides, then it turns a right corner and goes along the edge. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm combining two different pictures. Um, yeah, okay. So the, the one picture is what's happening in the sphere because this, the diffeomorphism group is a sub, is isometric to a subset of the sphere, right? And so the geodesic wants to leave that subset. Um, if I, if I try and get back to, if I consider what's happening with this, with my formula for eta x. Wait, the diffeomorphism group, now you, you mod the S1 is the red thing maybe. Yes. The diffeomorphism group is homogeneous. It can't look like that. But mod S1, yeah. the S1s might change and so, and collapse. So th what happens to the S1 when you hit the black point? Um, it's small or big or, or what? It's basically invisible as far as this picture is concerned. So it's. No, no, I know. This is the, but this is like the quotient of Diffio by the S1, yeah. right? So this is the image. So that's a pretty natural picture. I mean, when you have an S1 action on something and the circles change in size, 
then when you form the quotient space, you can have a boundary. They do this all the time in toric varieties. It's the picture they have. A toric variety is a beautiful manifold. It's got a torus acting on it. And the various ways the torus degenerate, you get an image, which is a simplex, a polyhedron. And, you know, and combinatorics, you know, they do all this combinatorics. So, so that's the so, picture. That's a familiar picture. I, I think that may be somewhat accidental because if you, so if you imagine taking uh, instead of this degenerate metric, uh, you took some lower order term, um, like to, to capture the, those rotations, right? And give them some non-zero length. Um, if you throw in any small term, you'll still get basically the same picture. Uh, it's no longer a round sphere, but it'll be, um, uh, you know, somewhat bumpy sphere. And the, the diffeomorphism group will still be a small subset of that. So I think of the, the boundary as being a real thing, which, which has nothing to do with the fact that uh, my metric is degenerate because the, it'll still appear even if I um, take a slightly different metric that's not degenerate. Okay. All right, so, so this actually happens and it, it does tie in, um, I guess the last thing I should say, uh, this coordinate transformation that you take your diffeomorphism, uh, you take eta x and you take the square root of that and you get some function f and you can write everything in terms of that function f. Um, that actually satisfies uh, a nice ODE, uh, unlike eta where the ODE can break down. In terms of f, the ODE never breaks down. And in fact, this is quite good for computations. You can see the same thing happening with the kamasa home equation, the same transformation, and you get global existence in the f variable. Um, fairly easily. And so for example, when you look at, my student Jamin Lee did this, um, when you look at the collision of solitons in uh, the kamasa home equation, that's apparently numerically a very difficult thing to compute. In terms of this picture, he was able to compute it um, much more easily. Uh, essentially because the change of variables makes the equation much better behaved. So your picture is it becomes a homeomorphism and then after a while it becomes smooth again? Uh, yeah. Huh. So there's a version of this. So in 3D, the 3D version of this picture is um, let's square the components. The sphere flattens out into uh, the convex triangular set and the geodesic here in, let me switch my colors. The geodesic here, um, instead of going through the wall and coming out, when you're squaring all the components, it bounces off the walls. And that's the picture I was describing before. Oh. Words. So this, so, so only, for, only for a split second is it not smooth. Yeah. Is, um, it, is it not smooth, or is it, or is it just that the inverse is not smooth? Oh yeah, it's 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 C infinity. It remains smooth spatially, eta itself. Uh, but you're right, the inverse becomes not smooth. Oh, I see. Okay, not a, okay, not a smooth diffeomorphism. Okay. So it's a smooth homeomorphism. Still a homeomorphism. Are you going to stop there? I think I should. It's four o'clock. Okay. Yeah. You can talk again. Do you want to talk again? Uh, think about it. Yeah, I, I got I got through like the first half page of my my notes. Um, so I guess there is more to say, but uh, um, I'm I I am available to talk again. Yeah. What about in two weeks? Uh, I think two weeks would be good. Okay. All right, I'll change what we have now, because it's me. <laughs> it's easy to change. Okay, well that's okay. Well, thank you, Steve, that was very enjoyable.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you.